when I got saved was that there were all these ideas about, well, now that you become born again, now that you've become a Christian, now that you've gotten involved in the church, or now that you have a relationship with God, we need you to be discipled. We need to teach you. We need to instruct you in the way you should go. And I was always fascinated because the one thing I was never told was to really read the Sermon on the Mount because in reality, the Sermon on the Mount, now that I'm older in the Lord, should have been the first thing I read rather than the last thing I found. Fortunately for me, as opposed to most other people, a lot of times people are given the Gospel of John, and I've never understood that because when I read the Gospel of John, I said, okay, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, the Word was the same was in the beginning as with God. And I went, huh? I didn't get it. So I closed it. When I read sentence one of John one, I didn't get it. Even though I was born again, you know, I had all this miraculous, unbelievable knowledge, this unbelievable appreciation of Jesus. I didn't get it. So I closed it and I started in Matthew because I had this little New Testament. So I said, I, I don't get this John thing, but I flipped over to Matthew and I went, oh, hey, check this out. You know, and I started in Matthew 1 and I don't even remember what Matthew 1 says, but I know it made sense to me. It says, the book, oh, look, gee whiz, the book of the generation of Jesus Christ. I understood that the son of David the son of Abraham I went okay I get it and then I went from Matthew onward and so obviously by the time I got to John I understood what was being said but when I got into Matthew I was reading along you know and I understood what was going on and then when I got to the Sermon on the Mount I went well that's what we're supposed to be this is Jesus's instructions to us that we, if we're following him, are supposed to do. And then, what amazed me was that, as I was reading a Sermon on the Mount, which is usually contained somewhere in these chapters that, you know, they're kind of mixed up the chapters, so they overrun sometimes a little farther, a little shorter than what the numbers say. But in chapter 5, 6, 7, and then at the very end of chapter 7, I was amazed, because then Jesus says, not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of the Father which is in heaven. And then it says, Many in that day will say to me, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. I was shocked. They could look like a Christian, they could talk like a Christian, but they're not a Christian? Then I read, Therefore, whosoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken unto him as a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And I got it. I said, I get it. Okay. So I need to do what Jesus says because Jesus is the one I'm following. Jesus said he was the Son of God. Jesus said that my Father is giving me to tell you what to do. And then the Father said, This is my beloved Son. Listen to him. And I went, okay, let me see. God the Father told me to listen to Jesus. Let's see, the Word of God is saying that, you know, I should listen to Jesus. Jesus is saying I should listen to Jesus. Hmm. What do you think? Do you think you should listen to Jesus? Or should we interpret it? Should we come up with our own idea of what he said? Should we kind of like make it something that doesn't really fit what he said or should we ask him what do you have to say God because you are the son of God and you did bring your disciples up unto the mountain to talk to them and then also the people came up and were astonished as they heard what you were telling them and then as you spoke to the crowds you spoke to all of us that we should do as you said to do what are you saying Jesus for us to do what is this teaching, sayings, statements that you've made that are so radical that it separates you and your followers from any other religion in the world that makes it what we call Christianity. But in reality, is those who follow hard after you to know the living God. And when we went through it, we've come up to the place where you said, 
to us today as we've looked at it, step by step, little pieces at a time, I have discovered that I didn't know really how real Jesus was talking to me until I took it one line at a time and I read it. <coughs> and when I read, blessed are, I went, wow, is that true? And I examined it one line at a time. And that's why we made this devotional and evotional about getting real with what Jesus said to do. Because if you don't know what he's telling you to do, you need to read it one line at a time. Stop after one line. Read it. If you think it's being out of context, read the whole context. No problem there. Then go back to that one line and understand what he said. Because he's saying it to you. He's saying it to me. This is what we're reading today in verse 14 of Matthew chapter 5. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Did you know that? Let's get real. Did you know that? You're the light of the world. But isn't that what Jesus called himself? You're the light of the world. But I thought Jesus was the light of the world. And that when people come to him, he reveals their sin because they come into contact with him and he kind of like shines on their lives. When people look at you, do they see you or do they see Jesus in you? You see, the world knows you're a light. Now, you could be a flashlight, you could be a little bit light, you could be a little candle in the wind, you could be a little flame that's about to be extinguished, you could be a giant spotlight, you could be a blinking light that's sometimes on, sometimes off, sometimes on, sometimes off. You could be a strobe light where you're flashing all over the place. You could be one of those giant beaming lights shooting up into the sky, not really pointing at anything. But let me be clear, you are the light of the world because everywhere that any of those lights are, guess what? Everyone in the world knows that's a light. Hey, did you see that fluorescent bulb? Yeah, that's a long tube light. Hey, did you see that LED light? Yeah, that's those little cool lights, you know, little tiny ones. Hey, did you see the old-fashioned light bulb that's just kind of round, you know, and filament, and you got to flip on the switch? Yeah, it's a light. But you see, it didn't matter the bulb it came in. What mattered was the light that it shined. Because none of those lights I described could operate and create light but they cast light and you can't create light but what's in you causes light to exist around you in you in your circumstances and in the circumstances of others because the Holy Spirit when you became born again that's what being born in the Spirit is the Spirit of God comes down inside you and becomes alive in you. And that's how you're born of the Spirit of God. That's how Jesus could say, I am the light of the world. And then turn around and say to his disciples, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill that cannot be hidden. In Jerusalem, when you go there, if you were there, say, thousands of years ago, or even in modern days today, you can see sometimes on the top of hills where they built a giant round wall, a structure, to kind of hold the earth back, but also more so to carve into the granite housing. And likewise for protection, because they were mutsas or kibbutzims or farm communities that they kind of structured it in a way for protection. So that when you go into some of these cities, they actually go around and around and around and around to the top of the hill 
and that's all the city set on a hill. It's very obvious. And in Jesus' day, the same thing was true. All the cities were set on top of the hill. When you go to Jerusalem, you go up to Jerusalem and you can see the wall and you see the city before you actually get into the city. But the point of a light is that when you're a light on top of a hill, you're shining all around. In America, they like to say the lighthouse and it kind of like, you know, shoots out into the ocean and sometimes it's a lighthouse that has lights that go all the way around in a circle so that it's flashing and it warns people of the rocks that are underneath. But Jesus says, you are the light of the world. What kind of light are you? Are you flicking a bick? Are you being fluorescent? Are you being an LED? Are you being the light that God intended you to be? Because there's one thing that Jesus is saying very clear here. He's telling you to do something. He's telling you to recognize. He's telling you to know beyond any shadow of a doubt beyond any doubts you have, behind any fears you have, behind any angst you have, behind any teaching that you've ever heard. You need to know, you are the light of the world. You're the one that has the answer when darkness comes in like a flood. You are the one that when the storm clouds gather, your light is still shining. You are the light of the world. You are the one that God has chosen to be there because light attracts people to itself. Light attracts moths, mosquitoes, <laughs> all these things you don't want because the enemy can see that you're the light of the world and he wants to stop you from being that light. But likewise, people that are in darkness have seen a great light and they go to it to see what is that because it's shining in the darkness. You are the light of the world. Don't deny the fact that you are the light of the world and that you have the answer in every situation that you find your family that's unsaved, in every situation that the people are looking for, in every circumstance of life, in everything that there is that God has told you to become. Jesus has said that to his disciples, to his followers, to the people that were there that were amazed, that this is what makes the difference between a non-Christian and a Christian is that you are the light of the world. Now, will you do what Jesus said? Will you be the light of the world? Or will you try to hide your light? Will you try to suffuse your light? Will you try to cover it or turn it off? Will you flick it, the switch, and make it so you're not the light of the world? Will you try to be less than what you are? Because if it's like a city set on a hill, no matter how hard you try not to be light, even by turning off your words, or your statements, or your actions, know it or not, every single non-Christian knows you are the light of the world. And what they want to know is, why aren't you acting like it? When Jesus said, the wise man built his house upon a rock. He said that they were wise because of one thing. They did what he said. Are you doing what Jesus said? Are you being the light of the world? Or are you trying to hide it? Jesus said you are the light. It's time to live like it.